Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, welcome everybody. Um, good evening. Uh, my name is Sarah Felice. I'm the director of Point of Contact Gallery at Syracuse University. Um, I'd like to start this evening by thanking the College of Arts and Sciences, as well as the Coalition of Museum and Art Centers at Syracuse University, who support our programs year after year. Uh, they help bring us programs like Some Art to You, even though we're not in person right now. Um, Some Art is a yearly community summer arts exhibition that Point of Contact produces in partnership with ADAPT CNY's Public Arts Task Force. So if you're interested in becoming more involved with their organization, our gallery assistant Sheridan, who's over there for me, but I don't know where she is on your screen, somewhere. Um, <laughs> she's gonna drop the contact information in the chat. Our artist this evening is Mary Stanley, a community figurehead in the arts and force in ceramics. Uh, Mary's sculptural, sculptural work has been displayed in galleries throughout central New York and beyond, including the Center for Contemporary Political Art in Washington, DC. Mary's first career was as an academic at Syracuse University where she taught, researched, and wrote about the concept of democratic citizenship and civic engagement. Mary trained in ceramics and sculpture at Syracuse University's School of Visual Performing Art. Her background in political theory and American social history, as well as her travels throughout the world, are frequent catalysts for her sculpture. Mary will share her visual presentation and proposal for a public art installation what Price Beauty, City of Bones. She invites Zoom participants to explore with her how art is produced and for whom. Art is this at the center of our contemporary tensions about what monuments should be, should be lining our boulevards, hanging on the walls of our museums, and be painted on our streets. We are witnessing in contemporary culture the role art plays in solidifying our understanding of present social movements, including Black Lives Matter. So without further ado, a woman, an artist, I feel needs almost no introduction, my friend, Mary Stanley. Oh, thanks, Sarah. <clears throat> well, let me give a little background for today's presentation. Initially, I did think that I would do a full-on presentation of a particular piece of public art that is part of a proposal that I hope someday in the sweet by and by when money falls from the sky, yeah, sure, um, might become a life-size outdoor exhibition, a public art exhibition. And it's called What Price Beauty? City of Bones. And the city of bones that I'm referring to is St. Petersburg, Russia. Two years ago, I went to St. Petersburg and I don't know, have any, has anybody, have, have you been there, Sarah? Do you, have you been to I have not, the theater? No. Um, it has within it one of the largest art galleries in the world, after the Louvre, actually, it's the second largest. It has three million pieces of art. And someone has estimated it would take you 15 years to see all the art in the Hermitage if you only spent a minute on each piece. Now, what I find intriguing and compelling about the Hermitage is that when I visited, of course, it's a magnificent city, it's called the Venice of the North, but that its history is really grim. And so I thought I'd talk just a minute about the history, and Sarah, if you could get a picture up of what sure. it looks like today, it'll give you a sense of the grandeur of this place. Just give me a second to share the keynote here. Ah, here it is. So this, as you're looking at, is along the Neva River. And you can see these grand buildings, and one of them is the Hermitage. But what I wanted to talk about is how this city was built and why it's called the City of Bones. The art that we experience now as tourists, and that I did, was based on building a city that was modeled after the great cities of Western Europe by Peter the Great, and you can see him down there on the horse. And Peter the Great, um, the thought that anyone would call him great is really appalling. When you think about the autocratic use of power and the way in which he used that power to create St. Petersburg. A quick example, 30,000 people, workers, enforced workers, serfs, artisan and craftspeople died building the initial iteration of St. Petersburg. And what, why I call it City of Bones, and many other people do, is because 
when workers would die in this cold, it's the, it's, I think, the largest city closest to the Arctic Circle. So just imagine it was a cold, miserable swamp for human beings, for animals and wildlife, it was wonderful. But for human beings, it was a horrible place to be. So imagine that you're working in the winter, and he insisted that people work through the winter because he wanted his Venice. And what when people would die, they would be wrapped in cloth, you know, probably pretty rough cloth, and stuffed in the walls to help seal up the mortar. So this notion of a city of bones that is built on bones and the hard, horrible, impressed work of human beings, and the price of that in terms of what we now visit as an incredibly beautiful city that has been restored since the fall, quote, fall of communism. And so I wanted to explore in my art how to capture that tension. And I will upfront that what I'm gonna be talking about in a little bit, and I hope with all of you, is our own capital city, Washington, DC, and who helped build that. And clearly, American slavery is complicit in the, in the construction of plantations, of beautiful buildings in our own capital city. And St. Petersburg was a capital city for many years. So I thought what I would do, and also, I want to talk a little bit later with all of you about the idea of the aesthetic in terms of the scale of cities, so that you see um, uh, Peter the Great, again, I hesitate to call him great, but Sarah, if you could um, sort of sure. move on to the next slide, you'll see that this is this very dramatic, very male monument that was, um, how could I, uh, Catherine the Great, this um, engaged artist to come up with a way of rendering Peter the Great. And she, again, could be seen as someone who collected art throughout Western Europe. I mean, she collected art and libraries. So in one sense, we could say, oh, that's great. But in another sense, she was very much complicit in the kind of czarist cruelty that begins with Peter the Great and even before that. So that's just an example of a monument that's depicting in an aesthetic way the, the nobility of someone who retrospectively was quite cruel. So now, sort of moving on to my own work, this is an example of what, uh, this is a maquette, a model of what it would be like if this were at human, at sort of life-size scale. So what you see is what looks like a kind of abstracted room in the hermitage. There's guilt, there's lushness on the walls. These are the actual paintings that are in the, the hermitage, the ones that are framed in my little maquette. And what I've done is I've included these sarcophagi. And they're, they, if, you, if, if you have been to St. Petersburg, you know the czars are buried in these amazing, whatever, receptacles. And this is sort of an uh, abstracted version of that. And what I've got um, on one, in one case, and one is, one is sitting next to it, one is on top of it, are the serfs who I'm representing as a way of saying that we're all stripped bare when we're born and when we die. So in those, you know, sarcophagi, there could be Catherine the Great, um, and the, any number of czars, but in the end, you know, art, life, renders a certain kind of equality, and that's the equality of mortality. So there's a symbolism I, I'm working with in terms of the two figures, the two bronze figures. The figure looks standing up. If you saw it in sort of real life scale, you'd see that it's a white guy tourist. He's got his shorts, he's got his cap, you know, because it's sunny and usually when you visit St. Petersburg, it's in the summer because in the winter, no one would want to be there. But anyway, and he's peering through this open frame into what I have considered the past. In other words, not only the human cost of St. Petersburg and all the art that the Hermitage includes, but also the natural cost. So Sarah, if you could move to the next uh, image. 
here he's again peering through and you begin to see this strange creature as well as the two serfs in their morning pose and he's looking through at this odd life form that's emerging and if you could move on sarah thanks and this is behind the piece and if this were outside life scale what you would be seeing is the the soft looking fabricy things are actually the wrapped bodies and skeletons that represent the workers that were shoved into the wall but i wanted to create a little tension with art because on the other hand when you do visit the hermitage you are in the presence of some magnificent art so i'm alluding to the value of art to the human journey by the cave paintings and i think we all recognize the cave paintings the sense that our human journey has always been accompanied by art sometimes corrupted by power sometimes freely expressed and in maybe later we'll talk about some of the free expression that's emerging out of the black lives of matter movement so that's one part of what's behind this beautiful room in the hermitage and then the other which is that weird creature that's emerging and that's my symbolism if you want to move on to the next the next uh, that's my symbolism of how nature will come back. And so you see the dead bird that was a beautiful form of life that lived in the swamp that was destroyed uh, in the building of St. Petersburg. And in fact, probably St. Petersburg should never be there because the city has flooded over 300 times because it's a swamp and a bog. So, and animals were displaced and killed and the whole migration patterns changed. So there's this dead, beautiful bird, but emerging, and this is the sort of ecological dimension of what I'm doing, but emerging is some new life form. In other words, we're not the only show on earth, literally, we're not the only show on earth. So there's, I'm trying to capture the cost on many levels of what happened happens when an autocratic vision is able to produce a grand city, but at what cost? So mm -hmm. I think, I think um, Sarah, Sarah, that may be all of it. There may be one more, yes. And I like this image because it almost looks like St. George and the dragon, you know? So there's a, an allusion to, you know, a sort of nobility when you look through, you know, nature rising, slaying the dragon that is us. Um, so I think that's it. And I think there's one more picture, right? And that's that sad, creepy creature. Um, so that's it for now. And in a minute, we'll return to sort of other images of how a city can be reclaimed for other purposes. But right now, I thought we could just start our conversation by maybe your reactions to the idea of when you think about the pyramids, when you think of, I mean, if any of you have been to Versailles, when my husband and I were there, the first thing we thought is, oh, many things. Um, French Revolution had to happen, you know, I mean, you can't be in Versailles and not know a revolution's coming. Mm -hmm. So that sense of, you know, power and abuse of human beings and nature can only last so long. Maybe that's a positive note for now. I don't know. Um, and maybe the murals that we'll look at in a little bit are also. So anyway, does anyone want to have a reaction first to this sort of quick trip to the Hermitage <laughs> of St. Petersburg? Anyone, I hope you got your mics on. <laughs> I don't want to dominate the conversation, so I'm, oh. I'm remaining silent for a minute. Okay, well, let me just, um, let me see. Hi. Okay, Elise, I know you're there. So what do you think? <laughs> <laughs> and um, under. So I've never been um, to St. Petersburg um, and the pictures I've seen certainly didn't um, show the bodies stuck in there. <laughs> no. uh, and so I, it's really powerful and makes me think of all the places I've seen that are kind of beautiful on one end and wondering, you know, what bodies may they not be literal bodies, but bodies mm -hmm. are stuck in like that. Yeah, thanks, Elisa. I know once you, as I said, once it flips the switch, it's really tricky, you know, to 
appreciate certain bodies of work. It's a, it's a real irony that when I think about the Hermitage, there's three million uh, piece artifacts, paintings, objects of art. And I wanted to see, so I did a little research of whether or not if that would have included contemporary and more diverse art because it's really, I mean, Peter the Great started this process of going and, you know, grabbing up every piece of Western European art so that, you know, Russia would become sophisticated and oddly, this is right before the Enlightenment, weird. But anyway, so I, I looked on online and they were very proud that they have a new permanent exhibit called Art from the Peoples of Africa. So I went into it and it is 42 pieces of art, most of them artifacts from hundreds of years ago. So it just suggests that, you know, tourists from all over the world are still going to the Hermitage and what art is in the Hermitage. And I think the Metropolitan Museum, certainly the Louvre are much better in terms of displaying a broad range of art. But that was the other side, you know, the flip side of what do we preserve and what do we consider art? But thanks, Elisa. Um, well, well, I would just say that, um, that you talked to me about this project a year or two ago, about thinking, thinking of doing it. And, um, and you had some drawings at that point and kind of a plan for how, how you might present it and where. And it's evolved really a lot um, from that point. And um, in particular, I'm, I'm liking what happens when you go around the back um, and you see like the cave paintings and uh, the stones that you've used and, um, the dead bird and the rising creature and the plants and the bodies. Um, it's, I mean, it's interesting to me that s some of the greatest evolution of this project has been what it reveals. Um, it's, I mean, it's, it, it truly is three dimensional now. It truly is something in the round um, in, in a way that, it, that initially it, it wasn't so much. Um, so I'm very excited about it and, and want to hear about, uh, about where it might be and how you might do this at some point. Mm -hmm. What I envisioned, and thanks Nancy for following that, what I envisioned is having this outside so that although the ceramic work would be pretty sturdy. Oh, I love the kitty. I'm so sorry. He's so <laughs> that like four times. It breaks up my seriousness here. I'm but so what, sorry. He just really oh, wanted to part of the conversation. <laughs> don't, don't. But what I, what I wanted to do was to make a pretty sturdy piece of art. But I also wanted parts of it to start crumbling. Yeah. Because part of the idea of any city, of any oppressive totalitarian, that there's an element of mortality, of challenge, of resistance, if only nature reclaiming, you know, abandoned cities with the vines growing over. So I like the idea that people could visit it at different points, if it were a public art piece outside, and they could sit and ponder, you know, this question of, you know, how wonderful things can crumble into ruin and you know nature can reclaim or they can say what a pity that beautiful art you know has lost its home so there's I, I i like nancy that you picked up on that because i do see it as an outside piece and people can walk around it um and have sort of enough kind of signage so that or people maybe don't need any signage they'll just be like eh, that's a creepy thing but anyway thank you thanks nancy um, what I, what I think might be a, a point here to switch, because thank you for comments on my work, but a point to switch to, and Sarah and I talked about this, is what's happening in the United States that is absolutely relevant to what isn't happening in St. Petersburg. In St. Petersburg, 
there may have been times, certainly during the siege of Leningrad, um, at the time of the Russian Revolution, when the Hermitage, when St. Petersburg was sacked. And for, you might say, good reason, regardless of what you think about Stalin later. Um, but anyway, the, the point is now in its iteration, it's beautiful and pristine. But we now in the United States are confronting cities and art at the level of cities and how they're changing in response to the pressure of social justice movements. And so I think that what um, we might want to talk about, and people can just throw in now, and this is really open, um, not just obviously for me, and that is what's happening in Richmond, because many of you may know that in Richmond, acting on the authority of an African-American mayor, LeVar Stoney, 14 of the 16 grand statues on Monument Avenue have been taken down. And the last one, Robert E. Lee, is right now there's a court case about whether and how it will be removed because that one belongs to the state, not to the city. So, I mean, how are we all thinking about how cities respond to, you know, social change? And I mean, this is such a radical opening up of the possibility of reimagining the capital of the Confederacy. I mean, I never thought I would live this long, and I don't know about any of you, but I never thought I would live this long. I've been to Richmond, and if any of you have, it is, it was monumental. I mean, you were just in awe of, you know, that simply because they were so grand and there were many horses. And I mean, the whole male horse protection of the, you know, Confederacy lost cause mm -hmm. was very viscerally positive. I mean, I think positive for, for many people in Richmond, the 150,000 that came uh, to the dedication of the, of the Lee statue. But anyway, I, I think we got to start talking. So what do you think is happening in the United States? How is, it, how is this all going to play out? Oh, that's a question nobody can answer, Mary. <laughs> oh, come on, Sarah. Just, just, come on, folks. <laughs> just, so how is it, it going to play in, play out? Um, well, I mean, I talked a little bit about this in um, the artist talk we did last week about how artists kind of set the tone for, um, oh my God, I am so sorry for my cat. He won't stop. Oh, don't worry, don't worry, don't worry. Stop. He's like going to bite me if I don't pet him. Okay. Um, so artists set the tone for um, cultural change. Mm -hmm. And I think we're certainly witnessing that. Um, even, even the exhibition we have coming in the fall touches on that big time and um, I, I'm, I'm the type of person personally uh, that believes that people are inherently good and I will say that I hope, I hope the US proves me right and I hope they make the right decisions. Um, some of the things that I've seen make me feel very disheartened. Um, one of my best friends growing up was black. I don't, I, I, I can't imagine living in her skin, you know? And I'll never understand that fully. Um, and I hope that everyone in this country has enough empathy to understand that they don't understand, but you can still have enough compassion to care for others, to make their existence a little bit easier, because we're not doing that right now. So I, I hope we make the right decisions. I hope we do. One of the things that when you were talking, uh, Sarah, one of the things uh, I was thinking about is this morning um, on NPR, I don't know if you're NPR listeners, maybe many little, of you yeah. are, yeah, there was a wonderful segment on Richmond. It's very, I'm very mindful of the importance of Richmond in our present discussion and in much broader discussions. But anyway, what it was is it was interviews with African Americans who lived in Richmond and live in Richmond and what it meant to, to drive down that avenue and that Monument Avenue 
and feel that it was not them, not their country, not their city, not their place. Mm -hmm. And right now, uh, the area around the Robert E. Lee Monument that hasn't yet been removed has become a community gathering place where people are grilling food, they're talking, they're laughing, jazz is being played. In other words, it's an entirely different sense of Richmond. And I know before we sort of went live, we were talking about what's going to replace those monuments. How do you reclaim Richmond for all its citizens and the role of art in that reclamation? And Sarah and I were talking a little bit just to kind of add to this, is that it, oddly, and not oddly, maybe predictably, some of you may know that in February, the Trump administration issued an, an executive order saying that any renovations or new buildings in DC, Washington DC, and possibly beyond, had to follow the classical style of what is considered classical Roman and Greek. And it's really interesting because that style is so ambiguous. On the one hand, it was the preferred style of Hitler and Stalin. On the other hand, at least the founders thought that they were representing a vision of you know, ancient Greek democracy and Roman, whatever, Ciceroian version of democracy. So I think it's interesting to speculate on what might happen to Richmond and other cities as more and more now, from the Trump point of view, it's called the cancel culture, as we all know, the cancel culture. But what if we you know, embrace it as a more positive notion of public art? And what would be you know, the use of that space and how would we use it? So I'm gonna throw this to Nancy. Nancy, what do you think? Because <laughs> well, you're always thinking. Well, one of the most um, inspiring things I've seen, which which has resonance for Syracuse because of Columbus, is uh, there was a statue that was toppled of um, a white explorer who had um, done horrible things to native peoples. And on top of the statue, there were several, um, this empty, empty platform now, and there were several native people standing around the base and on top of the statue was a young man dancing, a young native man dancing. And it was an absolutely exhilarating um, image. Mm -hmm. um, because what occurred to me, the imagery that occurred to me was that this vacant platform had become a grave. Um, uh -huh. That 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 the 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 um, heroism of this explorer had died and this was now his grave and that he the the young native man was dancing on the grave mm -hmm. Th this is what it and kind of generated in me mm -hmm. um and it's it's interesting that that richmond has become a gathering place i think there will that initially there will be performance that it, that happens mm -hmm. um a great deal of performance um and and by the way that's that is not the only instance I've seen of Native people dancing on top of these vacant, um, vacant pedestals um, that used to hold, hold these monumental statues. So I think we're going to see a revitalization of that. And you know, that kind of um, is on a continuum for what you're talking about with art, that you wanted your piece to somehow be able to degrade in the elements to show that these things deteriorate over time. And um, which I think is a very kind of interesting movement in art. Um, art that's ephemeral that degrades on purpose. There are some pieces at uh, the Stone Quarry Art Park that are, are uh, intentionally degrading. Um, there's one that has books, for example. And they're just wearing away in the elements. And uh, so there's art that ha occurs with light. There's temporary installations with light and sound. Um, so there's a whole um, kind of notion of art as not something that's substantial and eternal. Um, even though we're still working with materi materiality, right? We're making objects. But 
uh, it's just, it's a very exciting time. Um, and I'm thrilled at what's happening with murals in this country. I'm absolutely thrilled with it. Um, it murals needed to again become representational. Um, they had, we were headed in a direction of abstract murals that I think aesthetically was going to kind of, um, to me, it was a diminishment. Um, I think it, it kind of was used up. And now what's exploding is representational murals again, um, which I think in, in com is very community-based and is very accessible to the community. Um, and that's it's a, a democratization of the arts. Off the top of my head, that's all I got. So. Well, I want to make two comments. And then, Sarah, guess what? We got to do the rest of the keynote. OK. <laughs> uh, one, one thing that I, um, Nancy, that you, this image of people dancing and the piece on NPR this morning of people using that space where before they were clearly not not neither not only not welcome but almost ominously frightened by this notion i mean i i i mean when you see that huge statue looming over you know robert e lee god forbid and now i mean people are doing cookouts you know they're ha so that notion of um, the exuberance when clay, when spaces in cities are reclaimed or re renamed, reclaimed, whatever we want to talk about it. But when you mentioned murals, Sarah and I talked about this. I, I went online to see some of the murals that have emerged as examples of it may be ephemeral art. Uh, the ones that we're going to show are mm -hmm. ones that were made in Oakland, California mm -hmm. and in New York City that are on uh, boarded up buildings. And so, you know, they are by their nature ephemeral, but they're very powerful. So Sarah, can we move back to the keynote? Is this not, keep going? Um, are we seeing? Yes, we are. Yes. Um, this, Nancy, begins with, uh, can you read that? Maybe you can't, decolonize. Yeah indigenize and what na naturalize yeah. and you know when you were saying this notion of reclaiming going literally back to the founding as a form of reclaiming so thank you nancy we had that one lined up first <laughs> so that was, and this is again these are murals from new york city and oakland california so uh sarah should we go next Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow. And of course, we've seen, I mean, we've, we've heard the quote, Daddy changed the world, okay. the, the reference to it. Yeah. And here's just one of many throughout the world of murals. And this one I found very powerful to shut it down. I mean, mm -hmm. look at that, it, that the energy in it and the roots and the power and the breaking through. I mean, that, you know, again, I would agree, Nancy, that this is very accessible, but it's telling many, many stories. Yes. Yes. And, you know, it, I, I think it's extraordinary, just an extraordinary piece of art um, and an extraordinary, I, again, it is a accessible, but, pow but powerful in, in that sense. Sarah. Now this one is again um, a thoughtful one because not all not all murals are to be walked by. Some are to be stood by and reflected on. And this is Ida B. Wells. Now I don't know if that's a library, but I hope it is. <laughs> she was a great yeah. African journalist. I think it's a library, but I'm not sure. But I I loved that. I thought it was a very powerful, and it sort of makes you just, like stop, read, tend to. And again, accessible, powerful, mm -hmm. do you understand? And this one, I read what the artist was trying to do. And maybe we could just think about this, because this is very accessible. And he wanted it to be, as he was a man. A man has, has made this. And if you can figure it out, decode it, I think it's really interesting. Mm -hmm. Because it's, you know, it's it's got a lot of symbolism in it and yet it looks like a kid did it and yet there's lots going on 
And I don't know if I would have picked up everything if I hadn't read the artist statement, but I thought it was wonderful that a muralist had an artist statement. <laughs> you know, I mean, I thought that was like, great. Um, so I don't know if anyone wants to just throw out what they think is going on here. Well, I can't see the the whole thing because of my because oh, of right. my screen because I'm sharing it. Um, but I, from what I can see, um, this is actually um, a something I was just like kind of thinking about when we were discussing here is how we we build our nations on the backs of people that are less um, that we think of as less or that we um, marginalize. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. And, and that is almost exactly the intent of the mm -hmm. artist. He said, I mean, the idea of at the bottom, dirty money, you know, that we're scrambling and, and, and I'm sort of adding the we're, and he's speaking for all the people who are exploited and on the front lines, perhaps during the coronavirus, however we want to conceptualize. Uh, what's going on and the idea that it's built on our backs and you know the the sort of tension around justice and I and I thought that was just a very very powerful image very simple uh, what does dirty money mean is all money dirty I just thought it was it was it was good okay Sarah the next mm -hmm. this one I love that's beautiful I love this one it is wonderful it's very, um, it has like a comic element to it, but it's still very lifelike. Does that make sense? It's just, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. And this one, of course, is so contemporary that the artist hasn't finished it yet, uh, still working on it. And to the side, he sketched out a horse that's coming charging in. You know, again, the image of the batons and, and the police. Mm -hmm. And this, I think, is, of course, the extension of the logic of Black Lives Matter. Yeah. And I think um, many, many people throughout the world, many artists, have used the, this as sort of this, either the mural itself or the inspiration to riff on the idea of Black Lives Matter and the social justice images involved. Um, the racist dimensions of policing, uh, the militarization of the police. So the thought that people all over the world, you know, are creating murals that somehow capture their sense of what's going on in the world and what kind of change. So this is, I think, very optimistic. Um, but then we have to talk, I think, in the last part of our conversation, if we want to, <laughs> and that is, what do we all have to do to keep reclaiming cities? And, and again, I don't know, there are a number of people who are on mute. So, you know, they're um, observing this, but haven't, haven't joined in the conversation. But um, the question of what do we have to do to take back cities, you know, to dance on, you know, whatever, to create a generous, a generous notion of public art, of public space. And one of the things that I thought that, you know, we might want to switch to is what is happening in other cities in terms of the kind of confrontations that we're seeing and the language that's being used about protesting in the name of social justice and Black Lives Matter. So does anyone want to talk about, you know, I mean, I'm thinking of Portland because that's one of the more obvious places where the stakes are becoming increasingly high. The ironies are there, you know, the mayor got tear gassed um, and is saying, you know, we don't need you, meaning Trump federal presence of, you know, homeland presence. So this, again, the notion of what is a city, a space for protests, a space for free, you know, for free speech, a, pr a place for murals and art, but also maybe a place for confrontations. And, you know, this I think we're seeing and we're probably going to see much more of it. I think the sinister workings of the campaign aesthetic that is going to create a very grim vision of, I mean, on the part of the Trump campaign. I mean, American carnage, I think we've only begun to see how he's going to play on that. So I just thought we could talk a little bit about that. And Chris, Chris, 
Christine, do you mind if I Hi, put you on the spot? Hi. Go ahead. Go ahead. I'm, I'm, I'm enjoying your presentation immensely. Oh, well, Chris, what do you think about the protests going on right now in Portland? You know, I, I think it's uh, terrible, the uh, response we've had from the federal government to have a secret police come in and just grab these kids off the street and put them in vans. And, uh, you know, as I'm thinking this over, I think uh, we just can't take our, our freedom for granted uh, for one minute. When, when we finally get a grip on it again, uh, we have to have a lot of things in place because we can't allow this to ever be a situation again. Mm -hmm. This is, uh, and, and we're all at we're all at his mercy. And I think, especially uh, after the election, we're going to have quite a couple of months there, from November to January. Um, mm -hmm. Regardless of what happens, I think. Mm -hmm. But I think it's I think we're in for a lot more to come, and in the midst of this pandemic uh, too, it's. it's just the response to all of it has been terrible. And I think you're right as far as it's because of the election that he feels that he has to you know, crack down in this law and order way. For that 30% that might agree with him, I can't even believe it would be that many anymore. Uh, but it's, uh, you know, something you said earlier was, uh, was kind of hopeful when you said that um, you talked about the, that uh, nothing is permanent. <laughs> And let's hope that's true. Let's have, hope that's true about our situation today. Well, I have a friend of mine, and I don't know, I may get hate letters for this, who says that, that the reason why, why Trump continues is that he's made such a, de a deal with the devil <laughs> that he's got embalming fluid in his veins. But anyway, I mean, that's a, you know, is, is he going to be forever? But, but I think you're right, that that sense of what he's unleashed you know, can we get that back in whatever sense of the civic space? And mm -hmm. one of the things that I thought, and here, Jason, I know you're on board here. So hi, Jason. <laughs> you don't have to talk. He's, he's, uh, he's um, not visible or he doesn't have his mic on. But anyway, um, Jason, uh, our son, his work on how fascism works partly is about how you create us them and when i think about the use of the urban the cosmopolitan mm -hmm. the other the brown people the dark mm -hmm. people that is being constructed now in those ads are very very sinister and i i i heard a little snippet mm -hmm. from trump that was so bizarre he said that he had to bring law and order to the cities because people who worked hard to get out to the suburbs needed to be protected and it, it, that they worked so hard. So you can see that he's building another border. You know, there's yes. a border between Mexico and the United States, and now there's a border and he's sending homeland, you know, obviously homeland security. They're there on that border. Yeah, so thank you, Chris, for... He's, yeah. living, uh, he, he's living in the 50s. He'd like to bring us back to the 50s, mm -hmm. I think, when, when people well, move to the suburbs. So I just want to connect back for a minute onto your work, Mary, um, in, in this. I think the theme throughout all of this is we do build our cities on the backs of people that we think are lesser than us. And I think what we're witnessing now is... Um, so I, we, I have a friend uh, who is a former board member of Point of Contact. She's a dear friend, and I respect her tremendously. Um, she and I got in a long conversation about this, and she's a Black woman. She's a Black artist, and a lot of her work deals with race and her upbringing and her culture and who she is as a person. And um, we talked a lot about there's, there's a bigger, it's not just coronavirus, right? Um, we have a pandemic in this country that is racism. Mm -hmm. And I think this pandemic has drawn out um, a lot of what we've known for so long, uh, but have refused to acknowledge or just pushed to the side or somehow constructed this uh, environment in which it's, it's okay, but it's not okay. Um, and I think that what we see now um, is a person who is incredibly skilled at, um, and I never thought I'd use that phrase about Donald Trump, incredibly skilled at um, employing fear in others as a tactic to divide and conquer. 
Mm -hmm. so. I, I think you're, you're, you're right, Sarah. That was a, a really good summary because I think what I'm ambivalent about, and I'm tossing this out to everybody to react to, mm -hmm. you probably have heard about the wall of moms or the mom wall or I, the mother. It's a movement in Portland where basically primarily white mothers, women, have positioned themselves between protesters, a much more diverse group than they are, and the police. Mm -hmm. And in interviewing them, they have said in a way that is chilling, that they know that because they're white, the batons cannot strike as easily. And that's a horrible, horrible notion of the ultimate acceptance of white privilege on the part of the woman who said that. Mm -hmm. And she said, should we then not be part of this? And the interview, the next interview was with an African-American woman who's been working on Black, um, Black Lives Matter. And she said, God, no, stay with us because it reveals so much. In other words, absolutely you're right that Trump cannot as easily send in Homeland Security to beat on white suburban women mothers. And that's a horrible, I mean, think about that. That's horrible that that's the way we've organized our political community. That, and yet, you know, what did Martin Luther King do? What did, you know, I mean, you've got to be to in some extent strategic in terms of the resources and allies that you have. Mm -hmm. This actually began, this happened to Syracuse um, in the fall semester. And yes. early in the spring semester is that protesters were calling, students of color were calling for white allies to surround them and stand between them and the police. When Syracuse police and security people started to attack the students. Um, so this this has arisen, and I've heard um, different reactions to it. I to, today I heard a reaction: the white moms are not heroes. Let's get this straight. And it's like, no, wait a minute. This is this is going to make a difference. This is going to make a difference. Mm -hmm. So I I was ambivalent about it as well because it's another way of reminding people of their value, you know, and of the nature as you know, we were talking before of white privilege. Mm -hmm. And I, I think um, maybe in these last few minutes, we could talk about Syracuse. And I know, Nancy, I don't wanna put you on the spot, but you've been involved in criminal justice reform for a very long time. And do you think at the level of a small city like ours, that there is hope? of transforming the understanding of policing from the militarization of the police. I was part of a police community dialogue group and my blood just froze when the police members were saying, well, you know, we're recruiting from, you know, former military. And I thought, mm. is that a good, is that a bad, you know, I mean, is it to, you know, to change their way of thinking about safety? I don't know. Or is it to bring more militaristic values into the police and to create that us, them within the police? So I guess, Nancy, again, I'm putting you on the spot, but what do you, what do you think is hopeful about the whole confrontation with how policing has been used, you know, really since, you know, the fugitive slave law, Jim Crow, I mean, this is not new, but is it hope, are we at a hopeful moment? Well, I think we're at a moment where there's both hope um, and it looks very somber. Um, one of the things that's being revealed is how critical to the way things are, our police unions. And, um, you know, you have to realize that um, the police union in New York City uh, directly requested this federal judge to say that um, they can detain protesters indefinitely. It wasn't the mayor, it wasn't the DA, it was the police union. Mm -hmm. um, in Jacksonville, it was the sheriff who was holding the press conference about what he could provide um, for the GOP convention, not 
the mayor with the sheriff standing silently beside him. Um, in Portland, the police union is coordinating with um, the federal agents. The police unions have been very organized, highly resourced, very aggressive in the courts for decades. And they have primarily been holding up reform and uh, they're very insulated. And uh, they worked a very long time um, to be in the position they're in. And I would dare say in some cities that it's the police union running the police, not the mayor and not the chief. Um, so I think this is a structure that people are just becoming aware of. And it's, it's one of the most dangerous because they're the most committed to not allowing any oversight of themselves. So I think it's hopeful that actually this is coming to light. Um, as long as it's hidden and we have the illusion that the mayor and the police chief are running the police department, then we're, we're still in trouble. Mm -hmm. So it now looks much darker if we realize this other structure is there. So, so yes, I'm hopeful, but um, it's going to take quite a while to dismantle that. It's, it's more than putting some CRBs in place. It's much more than that. I do want to bring up, um, there was a gentleman who um, spoke at a, I don't know if it was city council or just like a meeting with the mayor. Um, it went viral. I'm not sure if everyone knows what I'm speaking on. Yes, uh, yes, yeah, so the, the gentleman, I forget his name, I apologize. Um, but he, he spoke about how um, the statistics of police that um, live in Syracuse, New York, um, only 8% roughly uh, of police live in the city of Syracuse, that work for the city of Syracuse. So we are in turn, so Mary, you and I both live in the city, you live in Strathmore and I live in Westcott neighborhood. Many of us here I think live in the city limits. Um, we were funding the suburbs. So the police officers that are working in the city um, are coming here, making their money. We pay for their salaries, their benefits, everything. And then they go and they live in Fayetteville mm -hmm. or Camillus or, or Jane, you know, wherever. Um, but we are funding the wealth of the suburbs and think about that for a minute too, when we realize that Syracuse, so if you look back, there was an article in the Atlantic, I think in 2015 about, we are the, one of the most, we have the most wealth inequality, I think top 10 in the nation. That's crazy. What are we doing? What are we doing? Well, I think Sarah, your point about when you don't live yeah. Um, within a city, but you quote, patrol it, mm -hmm. you are every day, you can see yourself going into a combat zone. Yeah. I mean, when, when Trump used the term surge, there's going to be a surge of four federal forces coming into cities where the mayors are radical Democrats. I mean, think about that, a surge you know, and we've used surge as that, as that image of war, you know, a surge in Iraq, a surge in Afghanistan. So I think that you're right, Sarah, that not seeing the continuity between my life and the lives of people in the community can begin that process of othering them, of, you know, seeing people as others. And I have to say, in, in the dialogue group that I was with, and it was with the Interfaith Works, and they have the police community dialogue groups. And I would say with the young police officers who were there, they again did not live in the city. Mm -hmm. But at least they were open to meeting people from the city in this context. And I think there was, a, 
I don't want to say like a, a Jesus moment on the way to Damascus, but I think there was. I remember uh, one member of the group, a very, very powerful African-American woman. She's a lawyer and she has worked in a number of a number of settings around human rights issues. And she suddenly moved from that you know, that hat, which was, she was very good. She was the co-leader. She was very calm. And then she talked about when her brother, who had serious mental illness problems, was, had, was confronted by the police. And she tried to tell them he was mentally ill. And it didn't make a bit of difference. If you're Black, you can't be mentally ill. If you're white, you can. They'll take you up to upstate. And she said she was pounding on the window of the squad car saying, you don't understand, you don't understand. She was almost crying in this meeting. And the police were like, oh my God. It was a, it was a revelation that things are not what they seem. That African American citizens have complicated, complex lives like other human beings. It was so powerful. And there was this kind of hushed silence, like, it, for one thing, because she broke through this, you know, the third screen, because she was like reiterating a story about her life, you know, and she was being so calm and so, you know, respectful. And then it was just, but you gotta know, you know, that this is what happens to all these middle class black people, you know, it's not, <clears throat> it's not something that happens to their image. <clears throat> of a crazy, you know, African American guy, you know, on drugs. But anyway, so it was very. So I think there are ways mm. of breaking that down. But boy, is that hard to do. I think it's enormously hard to do. Mary, what you were just saying resonated because um, I, for those who don't know, I live in San Jose, California, and I work for an association of behavioral health providers. And I'm currently grappling with a policy paper on how to respond to crisis calls that are not criminal in nature by other than police. And I think the, the general sense of the folks I work with is it's not enough to train police. We have CIT officers, there's training here, um, that it just needs to be a separate, separate system. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa, because I think that that's absolutely correct. I'm not sure that it would be very easy for police officers, even the ones who went through this, to move, switch their hats in a way that I think people know they have to have some a, a different way of thinking about who they are, what they're doing, who people are, you know, the range of possibilities at a moment, you know, that it's not just going to be violence and whatever the stereotype of entering into whatever the situation is. So I think that this may come out of, I hope, I don't know if it's possible, you know, and I'm, I'll, we'll have to be in touch and see what happens as this unfolds, Elisa. But I, again, I'm putting Nancy on the spot. Is that something that that might be possible in Syracuse to sort of disaggregate the police, you know, to that some of the typical policing that is really more in the domain of other kinds of interventions. Is that even possible within the police force in Syracuse? I don't know if people are even talking about that. Well, you know, trainings have been developed for police officers around mental health interventions and they yeah. won't take them. They've, they've had oh. packages offered to them. They won't take them. Um, that, you know, I worked at a, the admissions unit at Hutchings Psychiatric Center many moons ago. And um, we would have police officers bring people into us. Mm -hmm. um, they brought the white people to us. Mm -hmm. White people can be mentally ill. Yes, they can. And, yes. um, we would hear them through the doors say, you say you want to come in or we'll ride around the block a couple more times. Wow, yes. Uh, I mean, it was very clear. Um, so they were willing to, to bring people to mental health services, um, but they, they resist the kind of training that would allow them to, um, to deal with these things directly. Um, they're also, um, you know, they've been, they have been provided with um, uh, 
critical incident stress debriefing uh, services and some training. Um, and this happened after 9-11. Um, and that's very useful, whether you're a police officer or anything else. Um, and they have a very hard time with that because their culture is, you don't say I'm having nightmares. You don't say I'm scared. You don't say, you don't say any of it. You don't say any of it. So, um, you know, they, tr they truly are traumatized on their side of it, many of these guys and women. Um, so it's, it's just really complicated. It's not that there isn't training out there. It's not that there aren't services that could work hand in hand with them. It's not that there aren't services that couldn't, couldn't take some of this over. Um, it can't stay to where it is or many more people are gonna die. Oh, thank you, Nancy, for fleshing that out. And thank you, Elisa. And Sarah, are you here or are you, have you disappeared? <laughs> Where is Sarah? I have, I have uh, not disappeared. I just, my, compu my computer's getting a little hot from the video. <laughs> okay. Uh, what I, I, I know it's seven, it's after 7.30. So I, I, I'm just really grateful um, to all of you who, you know, jumped in and talked and to all of you lurkers out there, thank you so much <laughs> for for being out there and, and in spirit being part of part of the conversation. So Sarah, I throw it back to you. Okay, you well, yeah, no, I'm here. I'm sorry, my computer's a little hot from the video. So um, I just wanted to say thank you to everyone for um, coming this evening. Um, Point of Contact will be reopening on September 7th by appointment only. Um, so if you would like to come see us, please give us a call or shoot us an email. Um, Sheridan is going to drop our email in the chat for you. And um, you know, thank you and stay safe, wear your masks. <laughs> thanks, Sarah. And thanks for inviting me. Oh, thanks, of course. Guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, all. Thank you bye Sarah. Bye. Have a good night, everyone. Good thank you. Good night. Good night, Elisa. Good night. <laughs> good night, man.